Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is part two of the Moore's Murders video about Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. In part one, this killer couple had ended the lives of three children, Pauline Reed, John Kilbride, and Keith Bennett. This video is also brought to you by Audible. Audible has over 140,000 titles of audiobooks for you to choose from. Everything from nonfiction to fiction, history, self-help books, autobiographies, some of the greatest series out there like Harry Potter and Twilight. No, I'm just kidding, but Twilight is in there. <laughs> I love Audible. I use it every single day. Audible is so helpful because you can't always sit down and read a book. I personally can't always sit down and read a book and it's very easy to just pop it on, put your headphones in and listen while you go about your day. The thing I really love about Audible though is all the books are yours forever. They stay in your Audible library in your collection. You can scroll through your library and re-listen anytime. Currently I'm watching The Spanish Princess on Stars. It's a television show about um, Catherine of Aragon, who was the daughter of Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain. So I am re-listening to Isabella the Warrior Queen by Kristen Downey. I downloaded that book like two years ago, but I wanted to re-listen to it because the Spanish princess starts off where Catherine of Aragon is leaving Spain to go to England to see and marry her new husband, King Arthur, which actually we, we know she didn't end up staying married to King Arthur very long. He died and then she married his younger brother, Henry VIII, and the rest is history, literally. But I wanted to catch up on the background of um, Isabella and Ferdinand and Catherine and Spain, kind of refresh my memory about what happened before she left Spain. So I've been enjoying that. So if you want to try Audible, the link's in the description box. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you so much, Audible, for sponsoring the video. And let's get started. A few days after Keith Bennett's death, Ian Brady developed the photographs he'd taken of Keith before he buried him, and he developed them in his makeshift darkroom that he had made in his house. Afterwards, he showed the picture to Myra, and they both agreed that it was rather blurry and, you know, not a really good and crisp picture, so Ian said he would destroy it. Winnie Bennett, who was pregnant when Keith disappeared, she had her baby, a baby boy, and one night, when he was about three months old, she was holding him and feeding him, and she fell asleep while she was rocking him in her chair. She claims she was awakened by the sound of Keith's voice calling to her, saying, Mom. At that point, she says she realized that he was gone. On August 15th, 1964, Maureen Hindley, Myra's sister, got married to a man named David Smith. Now, David Smith is a big point of contention for those who are familiar with and follow the Moore's murders case. He is touted as the man who put an end to the killings, but some people think he's not what he may appear, or he may have been more involved in their crimes than he admits to. David Smith was born on January 9th, 1948, to a woman named Joyce Hull, who was gone from his life within two years. He was taken in by his paternal grandparents, Annie and John Smith, who he grew up thinking were his parents. When he was old enough to understand, they explained they were his grandparents and that his real mother had died. His real father, their son, John Smith, traveled for work and was never around. They legally adopted him, and David grew up in a house where money went out as fast as it came in, but they still lived comfortably. His grandfather was a diehard gambler. One day, Annie Smith would be wearing fur coats, and the next, her prized possessions would be leveraged in some poker game or dropped off at a pawn shop for quick cash. David Smith was very close to his grandmother, Annie, who he called mom. They actually slept in the same room, in the same bed, while her husband slept in a different room. And David would often go to the liquor store for her and buy her a couple bottles because she claimed publicly that she didn't drink, but she was a little bit of an alcoholic. So he was basically supporting her habit and helping her keep it hidden from everybody so she could maintain her public image. He was unremarkable in school. There's no parent issues, but when he was about seven, his father came back into his life for a time. His father, John Smith, who was incredibly disrespectful and dismissive to women, and he was often heard saying that a woman's greatest fortune can be found between her legs. For two years, John Smith made frequent visits with his son, bringing him little presents, bringing him to the zoo, and then one day, he just stopped coming, and he disappeared as quickly as he had reappeared. One day, David Smith had a conversation with Annie that changed his life and his perspective. He was wondering why he was able to get free meals at school. So there was a free meal program at David's school, and the kids who didn't come from as stable financial backgrounds or homes, they were able to get their meals for a reduced or, or nothing. 
and he knew they had money. You know, his grandfather was a gambler, so there was times when they didn't have a lot of money, but they had enough money for lunch. And during the times that his grandfather was doing well at the card tables, there would be basically boxes and boxes of cash just hidden in cupboards and closets. So he wanted to know, why am I getting free meals? Just as a curious kid. That was when Annie had to basically reveal the fact to David that his mother, in fact, wasn't dead. So they were telling the school that he was the product of a one-parent home with a single mother who, you know, didn't have a steady job and wasn't bringing in a lot of money, when in fact he had been legally adopted by his grandparents and he hadn't seen his mother since he was a baby. He had been told his mother was dead to find out she was alive after years of thinking that he didn't have a mother. It shook him to his core, and he got very angry with his grandmother, Annie. He screamed, he threw a fit, he kicked her in the shins, and then once he got that out of his system, she brought him in the kitchen and gave him a whipping for physically attacking her. After that, the closeness between them evaporated, and he began to call her Mrs. Smith instead of mom, and he refused to accept the free lunches at school. Not long after this, John Smith showed up again, argued with his parents, and then took David from the home, the home he had grown up in, the only home that he had known. Yes, he had just recently found out something that made him question everything he knew, but this was still a stable-ish kind of home for him. He was given a lot of love. He was given everything he needed. Some people even said he was spoiled by his grandmother and he had way more than most kids at school, which probably led to the conversation by his fellow classmates like, dude, why are you getting free lunch? It was late at night when John Smith came to get him and David was in bed and he remembers being scooped up by his father. All he had was his little white stuffed giraffe in his hand, and his father took him and put him in a taxi and drove him away from his grandparents' home. Suddenly, everything that had anchored him to the world was gone. This was a confused child who had just found out that his mother was not actually dead, and now he is taken away from his grandparents who raised him, and he's brought to this not so great place. The rooms that David and his father rented from a frail old spinster named Mrs. Jones were a far cry from the cozy and comfortable home he had just left. They were cold, they were dirty, and they were filled with lice. His personality quickly turned aggressive and his teachers at school noticed. He would get into fights often on the schoolyard and he even kicked the landlady, Elizabeth Jones, down the stairs one time. He really did not like Miss Jones at all. He hated her, in fact. He said she was a miserable drunk whose dog had bitten off the head of his turtle that he had, a pet that his father had given him. And worse than that, a male relative of Miss Jones had come to stay with them once, and since space was limited, he ended up sleeping in the same bed as David, and he ended up molesting him. David decided this was not how life was going to be. Living in a dirty, lice-infested apartment, he had grown up always being in nice, clean, fashionable clothes, always having everything that he wanted, being respected by his peers because he was part of a respectable family in the community. And now, how far he had fallen. And he wasn't going to accept that. One day, he woke up and he had some angry words with his father when he couldn't find a clean shirt. Probably something like, this place is an absolute pigsty. John Smith hit David with a chain and in response, David pretty much laid him out. He was sent to remand school for a while and then to the Stanley Grove School. The headmaster there, Sidney Silver, also ran a boxing school and noticed that David had a natural affinity for the sport. He entered the school's boxing championship and won. His father was so proud, he bought him a pair of boxing boots and probably gave himself all the credit for beating his son to the point where he felt he had to hit back and realize his natural talent. David had made himself into a new man, a man who could be aggressive in a socially acceptable way, and he was respected for it. But then something happened. Maybe he realized violence wasn't as fun when you were being applauded for it. Maybe it was because Annie told him he was going to get cauliflower ear if he kept boxing, but he dropped the sport. And he turned into the type of kid that you don't want your kids to hang out with. The bad news kind of kid. He modeled himself after James Dean, tight jeans and black shirts with the collars turned up. When he was eventually sent to the headmaster, Mr. Silver, for constant dress code violations, he punched the headmaster and he was expelled. But he kept the fight going in the streets. It was his opinion that the only way people wouldn't mess with you was if they knew you would knock them out if they tried. 
So he sought out a fist fight with everyone to build this reputation as quickly as possible. Now David lived only two doors down from Pauline Reed, and they had kissed a couple of times in their youth, but they had remained friends. Pauline's brother Paul was also familiar with David as they had played together when they were young. Paul remembers wrestling with David Smith in his bedroom one day, and David was kind of like on top of Paul, and Paul said he thought he saw two fangs in David's mouth like vampire fangs. Well, it turns out David Smith just had receding gum lines, which gave the appearance of a longer fang tooth, I guess. I don't know what this tooth, what is that tooth called? The incisor? No, probably not. I don't know any dental terms, I'm sorry. But the vampire fangs. He thought he saw vampire fangs. It was just receding gum lines. However, David Smith would take to placing matchsticks in his mouth later on to give the appearance that he had vampire fangs. So maybe Paul Reed was a little bit closer to the truth than he thought. David was interviewed twice after Pauline's disappearance, but only said that he thought the world of her. She was cute and sweet and he had no idea how she could have disappeared. He was as confused as everyone. He and Maureen Hindley had been messing around for a little while, so they were having sex. And in March of 1964, she told him that she was pregnant, so he married her, because that's what you did in those days when you got a girl into some trouble. Maureen lived with David and his father John for a little while, and when they got married in August of the next year, none of her family attended, not even her sister and her best friend Myra. They did not approve of a marriage to such a scoundrel. David was 16 and Maureen was 18 and seven months pregnant. And to celebrate their marriage, they went bar hopping and then they went home. That same night, their wedding night, after they'd been done bar hopping when she was seven months pregnant and they got home, they got a surprise visitor at the door. It was Myra Hindley. And she invited them over to the house that she shared with her grandmother and Ian sometimes for a drink. And this surprised Maureen and David because David really knew that Myra did not like him. She had even told him once, if you hurt her, you're a dead man, which I think is pretty common for siblings to say to the new spouses of their brothers or sisters, but you know, Myra Hindley probably actually meant it. When they got to Myra's house, Ian was there and they were welcomed with a bottle of wine and nothing but friendliness, which confused the newlyweds even more because Ian definitely, not only was he not a friendly person, but he had never shown any interest in David Smith or even Maureen for that matter. David was initially impressed with what seemed to be a very mature and cultured life that Myra and Ian were living and leading. They had wine all the time. They dressed nicely, even if they were just staying at home. They listened to classic music, they read many books, many books. When they had discussions, even though he didn't understand half the stuff that they were talking about, especially Ian, it seemed to be like they were talking about important things. That night they danced and had fun, and Myra invited the couple out again the next day for a drive to the lake. Now of course Ian had too much to drink, and he began to babble to David about the evils of capitalism and society. And David really, number one, he was a 16 year old kid. He didn't really understand what this much older guy was talking about. Ian was basically almost exactly 10 years older than David because Ian was born on January 2nd, 1938, and David was born on January 9th, 1948. So he's 10 years older than him, and they're both Capricorns, by the way. They share the same zodiac sign. Not that, you know, that means anything, but so is Bella. She was born on the 3rd of January, which is kind of funny because one of the, the hallmarks of a Capricorn is that they're condescending and kind of a know-it-all, which Ian Brady definitely was. But anyways, this guy was much older than him and he was condescending and he was a know-it-all. And David, who really couldn't have a discourse about these subjects, like Ian could. He just listened and he took it all in, but at first he didn't really take him seriously. He just thought he'd had too much to drink. When they got back to Myra's house, they kept drinking until the sun came up, and this was basically, these two days was what started what became a very close relationship with the four of them. Maureen and David thought it was a beautiful gesture, that it was an open door, saying that Myra and Ian accepted David into the family. From then on, the couples began to spend a lot of time together, and Ian and David became close. Myra and Maureen would go upstairs, bored with the incessant talk of the men, and they'd go to bed, but Ian and David would stay up drinking and talking all night. David had this to say about these nights with his new crew. At night, the girls upstairs, the boys together downstairs, curling up to sleep on the couch, him on the chair, never approaching me to touch, a wife upstairs, a friend close by, no frustrations, nobody getting hurt. I think I just felt contented enough to be impressed out of my mind. 
But David did notice that his new sister-in-law and her boyfriend had a very strange relationship, especially in public. Their relationship was pretty much devoid of any intimacy or affection at all. There was an uneven level of love between the two, in his opinion. Myra seemed to love Ian very much, but Ian seemed only to tolerate her. And although Ian quickly warmed up to David, Myra never did, only seeming more and more envious of the close relationship that was developing between them. Ian wanted someone else in on this with them, and Myra did not like that. This was something the two of them shared exclusively that separated them from the rest of the world. She noticed that Ian was trying to indoctrinate David with the same tactics he had used on her. She heard him ask David, what would you be willing to do for a lot of money? And he started taking David to the moors to shoot. Once Ian shot a sheep with a dum-dum bullet that he had showed David how to make. And a dum-dum bullet is essentially just a bullet that's designed to expand on impact, making any chances of survival after that extremely slim. In the early fall of 1964, Myra and her grandmother were relocated to Hattersley, specifically 16 Wardlebrook Avenue. Ian was a frequent overnight visitor, and the couple fixed the house up, decorating it and furnishing it with the money they made from their jobs, and continuing to take frequent trips to Scotland so Ian could get in his time with nature. Here in Hattersley, they continued their reign of terror. Myra and Ian became well known to the children of their new neighborhood. The kids pretty much thought they were friendly and treated them with a kindness and respect that most adults did not give to children. One of these children was Myra's next door neighbor, 11 year old Patty Masterson. She became close with Myra when she took an interest in Myra's dogs. And since Myra is such a, an animal lover, or was such an animal lover, she really liked that about Patty. The two began talking. Patty would often go over and watch TV at Myra's because because the Mastersons didn't have a TV set. Myra introduced her to Ian, and the three of them, along with many other neighborhood children, would often take trips together to the moors. It's just so sickening to me to think of Ian and Myra taking these kids to the moors so that they could walk by the graves of other children that they had murdered. Ian even once told Patty when she was thirsty to take a drink out of a brook that was right next to John Kilbride's burial site. Patty's mother, for some reason, didn't think it was odd that these two grown adults took such an interest in her daughter and other children. She said someone who loved animals as much as Myra did would never have been capable of hurting a child, so she didn't find that there was anything unsafe about the situation. Nothing ever happened to these children that Ian and Maya befriended, and they could never give an answer of why they hurt some children, and yet left others untouched and even were kind to them. In October of 1964, Maureen and David's daughter, Angela Dawn, was born, and they both loved her dearly. David was a doting father, and he took a new job to support his family. Myra and Ian would still make trips to Gordon often to visit Maureen and David, but they took no interest at all in that baby. In fact, the baby, Angela Dawn, made Ian downright uncomfortable. One month after Angela Dawn's birth, a month that marked the anniversary of John Kilbride's disappearance, a detective named Joseph Mouncey decided to reopen the investigation investigation into what had happened to John when he got promoted to chief inspector. He had spoken with Sheila Kilbride and he agreed that something wasn't right and so he decided to breathe new life into the investigation. He printed out the old posters, he bought radio and television spots asking for any new information about John. He even put on a reenactment of John's disappearance at the Ashton Underline Market where John's brother Danny played the part of John, which I can assume was incredibly hard for the family and Danny. Mouncey took such an interest in this case. It became an obsession, all-encompassing for him. Everybody started referring to John Kilbride as Mouncey's boy. On Christmas Eve 1964, Ian and Myra took their neighbor Patty to Saddleworth Moor. Patty tells the story of how they would all drink wine together before trips like this to the moors. And sometimes Ian and Myra would bring bags of soil back home with them and tell her it was for their garden. That Christmas Eve, Patty had been drinking whiskey and gin with her neighbors, and they were at the moors until very late, not getting back home until after 1.30 on Christmas morning. Unbeknownst to her, after they dropped her off, Ian and Myra went back to the moors to plan their next murder. It would be a little different this time. The next day, Ian presented Myra with a record for Christmas. Girl Don't Come by Sadie Shaw, a popular song in the UK charts at that time. And Myra gave him a new reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Myra brought her grandmother over to her uncle's house to celebrate Christmas, or Boxing Day, as they call it. And while Myra was doing that, Ian prepared the home for what was going to come next. Because this time, they weren't going to kill their victim on the moors. 
they were going to kill their victim in this house. He set up his camera in Myra's bedroom and he hid the new tape recorder under the bed. When Myra got back, she told him they had until 9.30 that evening when she had to go back and pick her grandmother up. They went to Silcox Wonder Fair on Holm Hall Lane in Manchester and walked around with boxes full of groceries they had just purchased, looking for a child who appeared to be alone. Leslie Ann Downey, a 10-year-old sweetheart with full cheeks and tousled curls, she was shy, but she opened right up when she was singing or dancing, two things she loved to do. She lived with her mother Anne, Anne's boyfriend Alan West, and three brothers. Anne had just separated from Leslie's father earlier that year and had met Alan at a truck stop where she worked as a waitress. Leslie woke up on Christmas morning to a special set of presents from her older brother Terry, a matching necklace and bracelet of white plastic beads that he had won for her during his visit to the fair. She immediately put them on and spent the day playing with her toys. Her mother promised her that later she would show her how to use her new sewing machine, another Christmas gift, to make dresses for her favorite dolls. Leslie and her younger brother Tommy wanted to go to the fair as well, and they had been planning on going with Terry, but he was very sick when he woke up that morning, so they planned then to go with a downstairs neighbor of theirs. When they got to the neighbor's house, it turned out she wasn't feeling well either, so the two young children set off towards Silcox Wonder Fair on their own. Leslie was the senior member of their little party, since Tommy was just eight. They had a good time at the fair. Leslie loved watching the rides with their lights and fast motion, but they soon ran out of money and they headed back home. However, on the way, Leslie made the decision that she wanted to go back to the fair. And she said, I'm going back. She turned around and ran away before any of the other kids could say anything. When Myra and Ian spotted her, she was staring at the fast moving rides as if she was transfixed. They approached her with their boxes full of groceries and they pretended to be struggling under their weight, asking Leslie if she would help them get the boxes back to their car. Once they got to the car, they asked her if she would help them get the boxes home and they would drive her home afterwards. She got into the back seat and they piled the boxes of groceries around her maybe to hide her from view or maybe to prevent her from running if she got suspicious. They drove her back to Myra's home that she shared with her grandmother in Hattersley. And when they got inside, Ian went right upstairs. And a few moments later, Myra asked Leslie if she would bring the boxes upstairs to Myra's bedroom where Ian was already waiting. When Leslie entered the room, Ian switched on the tape recorder. Unlike Ian and Myra's other crimes where their stories contradict each other, we know exactly what happened to Leslie and Downey because it was recorded. It's really disturbing stuff, guys. I know there's a transcript out there, and I think there might even be an actual copy of the recording floating around. I don't know who would want to hear it. Just trying to read the transcripts, it, it breaks you from the inside out into a million, a million little pieces. Leslie clearly knew something bad was going to happen to her when the two adults began to handle her roughly and tried to put a handkerchief in her mouth to gag her. Both Ian and Myra can be heard on this recording, and at one point Ian tells Leslie that if she doesn't put her hand down immediately, he's going to slit her throat. Leslie can be heard begging on the tape to be taken to her mother. She wants to see her mother and, and asking Ian and Myra to let her go because she can't breathe. The 16 minute tape had the little drummer boy playing in the background because remember it was Christmas day. And when it was played for an all male jury later at the trial of Ian and Myra, many of them dissolved into tears when hearing the 10 year old girl's last moments. After the murder, Myra bathed Leslie's body to get rid of any forensic evidence. Now Myra once again claims that Leslie was killed while she was running the bath. Brady claims that Myra is actually the one who strangled Leslie. He claims she used a cord, a cord that she would afterwards often pull out and stroke lovingly to remember the incident. Leslie was wrapped in a bed sheet and brought to their car around 8 p.m., but the weather had turned very icy and snowy while they had been inside. And on their way to the moors, they realized that they had to turn around and go home. It was just too dangerous. Myra's grandmother had to be picked up from Myra's uncle's house, but Ian was very adverse to the idea of picking Gran up while Leslie's body was still in the car. So Myra came up with the solution. She drove to the uncle's house and went up to the door and said that she couldn't bring her grandmother home because it was just too dangerous to drive with her grandmother in the car at that point. So they went back to Myra and Gran's house in Hattersley. Ian carried Leslie's body back inside and placed her on Myra's bed before the two of them took up their cozy spot on the couch bed in front of the fire. Ian hastily developed some pictures he had taken of Leslie and they watched them by the crackling fire and listened to the tape recording of Leslie's last moments. They then fell asleep in each other's arms. 
When Leslie's little brother Tommy had gotten back from the fair and told Leslie's mother that Leslie had turned back around and gone back to the fair, Anne and Alan went out to look for Leslie and bring her back home, but she was not there. She wasn't at the fair. She wasn't on the road between the fair and their home. She wasn't anywhere to be seen. After they looked for hours and verbally berated the neighbor who had been supposed to accompany the young children to the fair, they called the police. The police sprung into action. They questioned neighbors and fairground workers, but nobody had seen her. Nobody could give any reliable information. They printed posters. They went to all the establishments where they thought a little girl might wander into, but nothing. As the search was underway for Leslie the next morning, Ian and Myra drove back out to the moor with Leslie's body back in their car. As Myra kept watch, Ian walked out to the moor with the little figure cradled in his arms and buried her. After they went back home, Myra made breakfast for the two of them and then went to her uncle's house to pick up her grandmother. On New Year's Eve, Myra and Ian went to a party with Maureen and David and Maureen and Myra's parents, Nellie and Bob. Everyone thought that Ian, who arrived with an armful of liquor, was in an extremely joyful and cheerful mood. He even went so far as to stroke baby Angela Dawn's hair. That same day, Leslie's picture was found on the front page of every paper, and Patty, Myra's neighbor, came over and told Ian and Myra that she had known the girl a little bit and that she was missing. Myra and Ian had her read a newspaper article about Leslie's disappearance out loud while they secretly tape recorded her doing it. They recorded Patty talking about how she had known the girl and Myra prompting her with questions. This tape was added to their growing collection of trophies. Throughout January, the search for Leslie continued and Alan West was brought in several times just like the other fathers and stepfathers of the other missing kids and questioned. Leslie's entire family was a mess. Her older brother Terry, who had been too sick to accompany his younger siblings to the fair that day, carried that guilt around with him forever. He never stopped thinking about how things could have been different had he been there. He says if he had been there, it never would have happened and Leslie would have still been with him. Anne, Leslie's mother, could not sleep or eat and she sent out public messages to other mothers. Don't let your children out of your sight because you do not know the heartbreak of losing them until it happens. Leslie's new sewing machine was never used. It sat there in her room, which was kept exactly as she left it, waiting for her to come back so her mother could teach her how to sew baby doll clothes with it. In February of 1965, Anne put out an award of 100 pounds for anybody who had information about what happened to her daughter. Maureen mentioned this to Ian and Myra, saying, her mother must think a lot of the child, which caused Myra to break down laughing. This to me is a sign that Maureen Hindley may have shared some of her sister's coldness and heartlessness because as a mother herself, how could she ever make that statement about a little 10 year old girl who was missing and the mother who was so desperate to get her back, she would have done anything. In April, Hindley once again got rid of her car and got a new one which had the same feature of the of seats which folded back for more room in the back seat. They didn't want to hold on to the same car for too long in case there was any evidence in there that they had failed to get rid of. This same month, the couple left for another trip to Scotland and this time they wanted to take Patty with them, but Patty's mother finally having some sense in her head said she didn't think that was a good idea. When they got back from Scotland, Ian made the move permanently to live with Myra and her grandmother. He had already been spending a lot of time there anyway, so this just seemed right, but then the relationship with Patty soured when he saw her trying to climb over their fence into their garden and he accused her of trying to steal things out of the garden and he told her that if he ever saw her doing that again, he'd break her neck. Patty never said another word to Myra or Ian. I think that she saw something in his eyes, something in his tone, it told her that he was serious. At the end of April, six month old Angela Dawn came down with a case of bronchitis, but she didn't make it. She died on April 25th. David left work and rushed to the hospital where he was told that his daughter was gone and he completely destroyed the room that he had been notified in, just completely trashing the place. He couldn't wrap his head around how this had happened. He remembered before he left for work that morning, he'd been playing with his daughter, she'd been laughing, she would seemed fine. Something in him broke. He went home, he gathered all her toys and her clothes, put them in a suitcase, and then threw them over a railway embankment, which to me is a very strange reaction, but everybody mourns differently, I guess. When Myra and Ian were given the news that Angela Dawn had passed, they were watching TV, and their reaction was pretty much indifferent, except for Ian being annoyed that all the talking was interrupting his TV program. 
David and Maureen both left the house and lived in different places for a little while. But at the baby's funeral, Myra exhibited a strange and rare case of emotion. She was looking down at her baby niece in the open casket when tears began forming in her eyes, smearing her heavy makeup. David Smith recalls that she was clearly embarrassed by these tears, wiping them away very quickly. She didn't want Ian to know that she had felt anything, that she had shown any emotion for this child. And it was an open coffin. And I think that she wasn't prepared for that. So just for a few seconds, the tears appeared in her eyes. That's all. I'm not over elaborating this. It was seconds. And it had smudged the makeup under her eyes. She wore very dusty Springfield type makeup under the eyes, very heavy black mascara type eye makeup. And the watering of her eyes had made the makeup run. She quickly got a grip of herself, quickly got a grip of herself, and then she was more concerned about if she went outside and Ian would notice that she'd showed emotion. And I've got to emphasise, it's only a few seconds of emotion but she had to dry her eyes and clean her eyes before she returned back to the car. After the funeral, Ian and Myra brought the grieving couple to the moors, where Myra told her sister to stop crying about that baby and get a dog. Ian and David were walking alone on the dark moor when suddenly Ian told David to stop and look up at the moon. And both men stood there on that spot for a little while, about 10 minutes, staring up at the moon. Finally, Ian said, okay, that's good. Let's get back to the car now. And they walked away. It was only later that David would discover the spot they had been standing on, looking up at the moon, on the day that he had just left his baby daughter's funeral, was the spot where John Kilbride had been buried. After this, the trips to Saddleworth Moor continued with David and Maureen, who were happy for the distraction from their grief. And in July, Maureen and David moved to Hattersley, pretty close to where Ian and Myra lived. This only strengthened the friendship between the two men, which gave Myra an extra dose of jealousy. David seemed to be able to put Ian at ease and make him laugh in ways that she never could. She resented their seemingly special relationship because she had done things for and with Ian that were gruesome and horrible. She did them, according to her, so that she would be bonded to him for life. They would share this always, just the two of them. And now it seemed like David was able to weasel himself into Ian's good graces simply by being himself. David would come to their home every day to see Ian, and Myra would sometimes lie and tell him that Ian wasn't home, or make him wait across the street for Ian, and she would flash the light when he could come back over. Her anger grew when Ian gave David the same books that he had given her when he was preparing to welcome her into his dark world. Ian appreciated what an eager student he had in David, who would return the books with notes scrawled next to certain passages, and would discuss at length with Ian what he thought about them. Just as the death of Ian's dog had changed him, the death of David's daughter brought out a new level of aimlessness and doubt in the young man who had once not taken Ian Brady's ramblings seriously, but now hung on to every word. Using the same tactics that he had used with Myra, Ian asked David if he would be willing to rob a bank, and David needed the money, so he said sure. They started planning it, just like Ian and Myra had. They started planning it for weeks. David even went so far as to sit outside the bank and take detailed notes on when the money drops came, what employees worked what days, what shifts they worked. When he presented Ian with this notebook of detailed intel on the bank that they were supposedly going to rob, Ian barely looked at it and put it aside and the bank robbery was allegedly never brought up again. I don't think Ian Brady was ever interested in robbing a bank, not with Myra, not with David, this is my opinion. The bank robbery thing was just sort of an initiation to see if Myra first and now David were willing to dip their toe into the pool of illegal activity. You have to start small. You can't just start talking to somebody about committing murders. You first have to see if they're of that personality that they might be open to it. And now, because of how quickly and eagerly David had taken to the bank robbing plan, he knew David was ready. He began slowly talking to David about death and killing. During one of their late night drinking sessions, Ian pointed a gun at David and said, look at me, look at the gun. This is how easy it is to kill. Ian went on to describe how easy it actually would be, how he wouldn't even see it coming. Blink, and you won't even know I've shot you. Look at that gun, you're about to die. And then he pulled the trigger. The gun wasn't loaded, and terrified David, who had been staring down the gun's barrel, sat there trying to regain his composure, while Ian casually went on to explain that this is how easy it was to kill, to die. 
Myra was not on board for how much of himself Ian was showing to David. It was happening too quickly, and he was putting them both at risk. On another night of drinking, Ian revealed to David that he had killed someone before. He got the impression that David didn't believe him, which made him angry and caused him to spit out, I've got photographic proof, and you've sat on one of their graves. According to David, even after these confessions, he still didn't really believe Ian, and he just thought it was the kind of junk that comes out of your mouth when you've had too much to drink. On October 6th, 1965, Ian presented Myra with a new record. It's Over Now, Baby Blue by Joe and Baez. After work that day, Ian took the dogs for a walk while Myra dressed in a tight leopard print dress before the two of them drove to Manchester Railway Station at about 8 p.m. On the way there, they saw a car in front of them hit a dog. So Myra pulled over and asked the dog's owner if he needed help, if he would like them to take the dog to the vet. The dog's owner said, no, I think he'll be okay, he seems fine, and they kept driving. As Ian was trying to get into the station bar to buy wine, a young man walked by and told him it was closed. Edward Evans, known as Eddie, was a 17-year-old boy who lived with his parents, Edith and John, and a brother and sister. He was known as a well-dressed young man, and on the evening of October 6th, he dressed in dark blue jeans, a white shirt, a suede jacket, and dark brown Italian leather shoes before leaving his house to meet his friend, Michael Mahoney. They were planning to see the Manchester United play, and had made arrangements to meet at Auntie's Bar on Oxford Road. When Michael never showed up to meet him, Eddie headed out to the old Trafford soccer stadium on his own. When he informed Ian that the bar was closed, the two men began to talk, and Ian claims that he recognized Eddie from a local Manchester gay bar that he had been to a couple of times. He invited Eddie to come back to his place for a drink, and the young man accepted. When they got back to the car, and Eddie saw Myra in there, Ian introduced Myra as his sister. The three drove to the Wardlebrook Ave house, and when they got there, Ian told Myra to go get David. There was a knock at Maureen and David's door around 11.15 p.m. They were both already in bed, and when Maureen answered, she was surprised to see her sister standing there. Myra said she had a message for her to tell their mother that she wouldn't be able to see her that week. She could only see her on the weekend, not before. Maureen, who had just been woken up for what seemed like an unimportant message, was very confused. But as she was trying to process it all, Myra looked at David and asked him if he could walk her back home because it was very dark, the streetlights were out. David Smith claims that when Myra arrived at his home that evening, she was already wearing what she called her killing clothes, which included a long raggedy skirt. He claims he had no idea what was happening at the house of Ian and Myra at that point, that he was just walking Myra home and she offered to get him some mini wine bottles she had inside. Myra claims that he was a willing participant, that he knew exactly what was happening, that they had planned it out with him and he was waiting for her to arrive when she got there. He was already dressed and ready. And before he left, he grabbed the stick he used to walk the dogs, which was just basically a really long stick with a length of rope at the end of it. The events that happened next are very complicated because all three people who were there at the time, Ian, Myra, and David, they have very different accounts of what happened. David says when he got there, they went into the house together and Myra said, you know, the wine bottles are in the kitchen, come with me. And while they were in the kitchen, she said, hold on a minute. And she went into the living room. And at that point he heard loud screaming and she shouted, David, help him. He then ran into the living room and he saw Ian Brady hitting Edward Evans with an ax and then strangling him. All of a sudden, the screaming, the swearing, this banging around, she screams, Dave, Dave, help him. I go running into the living room and Brady's got this lad whacking him and whacking him and hitting him and hitting him with an axe. It's very violent. Very, very violent. The lad is on the floor. Brady's still hitting him. He then strangles him. He's swearing at him. He's calling him. He's cursing him. It's calling him filthy names, and then it's over. It stops. He says he just stood there shocked, obviously, but it became very clear to him very quickly that he had to act completely normal or he would not be walking out of that house. He says he didn't care what happened next as long as he was able to walk out of that house. I'm there, Hindley's there, and Brady's there, and everything has to be normal. I emphasize this, it has to be normal. 
or else I don't walk out of that house. Now, what steps are taken after that is purely leading up to me going out of that house. I don't care as long as I get out of that house. He helped them wrap up Eddie's body, carry it upstairs to Myra's room, and then clean up the mess in the living room. According to David, it was mostly he and Myra who were cleaning while Ian walked around holding the ax and asking David to feel the weight of it. He passes me the ax. Feel the weight of that. How did he take that? Feel the weight of that. Myra sat down in a chair next to the fireplace and put her feet up and said, I saw the blow register in his eyes. He never saw it coming. He never saw anything. He never knew anything. I saw the blow register in his eyes. It's a normal conversation. I know it sounds unbelievable. It's a normal conversation. They were cleaning up a bloody murder scene and Ian and Myra were just chatting as if they were asking what they should have for dinner the next evening. David Smith said, quote, If they had walked in with chocolate biscuits and tea, I would have stayed and drank tea and ate chocolate biscuits. I would have done anything to get out of that house. She would pick bone and hair up off the floor and not have a problem with it. Just drop it in the bag. There was no, oh, would, you, would, would, would one of you pick that up? I don't want to. No. Just straightforward. Early the next morning, after they had finished cleaning up the living room and apparently had some wine to drink, David walked home covered in blood. When he got home, Maureen was still sleeping. He immediately went into the bathroom and threw up, and then he woke her up and told her everything. Now let's rewind. According to Ian, Myra and David approached the door to the house on Wardlebrook Avenue together. They knocked on the door and Ian answered it. And then in a very loud voice, loud enough so that Eddie could hear him in the living room, he said, oh, you want those wine bottles? They're in the kitchen. He then left them in the small hallway while he went into the living room and killed Eddie Evans. He says that the noise from the murder was so loud that even Myra's grandmother woke up at one point and shouted down and asked what was going on and Myra had to shout up to her that everything was fine and just go back to sleep. In the heat of the attack on Edward Evans, Ian had hurt his ankle, so he knew the disposal of the body would have to be put off until the next day. So all three of them made this plan together. They took notes and they made a disposal plan, basically, for Edward Evans' body that they all sat there and agreed on. They even talked about how it was going to be difficult to get Edward from the house to the car the next morning. David Smith volunteered the use of Angela Dawn's stroller, which he still had. So they planned that the next day after work, David would be waiting outside of Millward's for them. They would all take the stroller and go to Ian and Myra's house, get Edward's body, put it in the car, and then drive to the moors and dispose of it. They wrote this all down on a piece of paper, which was found in Myra's car later. Ian took the string off of David's dog walking stick and basically tied Edward Evans into a fetal position. And then they all carried Edward up to Myra's bedroom and put her in the bedroom and then closed and locked the door. And after this, Ian said he felt David had passed his initiation test with flying colors. Myra and Ian both claimed that Myra was not in the room when the attack happened on Eddie. But David's statement about how she had said she'd seen the blow register in Edward Evans' eyes would suggest otherwise. Additionally, the shoes that she'd been wearing that evening had blood on them, and not smeared blood like you might expect if somebody was cleaning up a murder scene, but arterial blood, which means she was very close to the victim when he had been struck with the ax. Her response to that ended up being that she'd not been wearing the shoes that night they were in the living room when the attack happened, but she hadn't been in the shoes or in the living room. However, there was no blood found on the inside of the shoes, which leads you to believe that somebody was in fact wearing those shoes, was standing very close to the victim as he was murdered, and then lied about it afterwards. Let's, let's be honest here. Nobody thinks that Myra was not a willing participant in this, no matter how many times she tried to convince everybody that she was just the bait or just another victim, no matter how many times she claimed to not be in the same vicinity. This proof, her bloody shoes, without blood inside of them, so she was definitely wearing them, puts her at that scene for Edward Evans. Therefore, I have to believe that she was at every other scene as well during the murders. The song that Ian had dedicated to Myra to commemorate Eddie's death, it's over now, Baby Blue. It was pretty accurate, considering for Ian and Myra, Edward Evans' death would be the catalyst that would bring their whole world crashing down. For them, it was really over. 
After David Smith emptied his stomach, he woke Maureen up, he told her everything, and they decided they had to go to the police. He remembers that Maureen asked him, well, is my sister okay? And he was like, yeah, dude, your sister's fine. Are you listening to me? She's a part of it. She's like a part of this. She's a murderer. So I'm showing her my clothes. Look, look at me, look at, we've got to do something. We decide we're going to the police. At the police station, David told them everything that had happened, that the body was still in the house. He also said that Ian had told him that he'd killed before and that possibly some of these bodies were buried on the moors because Ian had also told him that he'd sat on one of the burial sites. Four squad cars were sent to Wardlebrook Avenue. Two of these were specifically meant to block each end of the road so nobody could come in or leave. And David Smith was sitting in one of these squad cars, very nervous, right? He was probably panicking, thinking, what if they move this body already? What if it's not there? They're gonna know I said something, and if they don't get arrested today, they're gonna come for me. At the same time, Craig's Pantry, it was a bread delivery service, they were delivering bread in the area. So one of the detectives, Sergeant Talbot, he asked the bread delivery guy, can I borrow your white coat and like a basket of bread so he could pose as a bread delivery guy when he walked up to the front door of Myra Hindley's house. Myra Hindley answered the door. She had just been about to walk out and go to work. She was dressed in her work clothes and the sergeant remembers thinking she looked like a woman in her mid thirties. She had heavy makeup. Her hair was teased and you know, really high on her head and she just had that hardened look of a much older woman. Myra was in fact just 23 years old, and when he asked her if her husband was home, she simply replied, I don't have a husband. He then told her, I'm a police superintendent, and I have reason to believe that there's a man in this house. And she said, there's no man in this house. Then Talbot told her, I received a report that a violent incident happened here last night, and I'm here to investigate it. And she was like, nothing happened here, we're all good. They finally pushed past Myra and they found Ian sitting in the living room on a fold out couch writing a letter in his underwear basically. He didn't even look up as the police entered and began sweeping through the house. Talbot went upstairs and saw Myra's grandmother sitting in bed and drinking a cup of tea, but when he tried to enter the second bedroom, Myra's bedroom, he found that it was locked, and he was like, I need to get in here. And Myra said, well, that's where I keep my guns, so I keep it locked, and the key's at work, and it's not convenient for me to go get it. He basically told her, listen lady, I'm not leaving this house until I can get into that bedroom, so he went downstairs to get one of the other police officers to head over to Millward's and get the key. When he got there, everyone was basically just standing in the living room watching Ian, who still hadn't said a word and hadn't looked up, finish writing his letter. When he was finally finished writing it, he did look up and he said to Myra, you better give them the key. A fight got out of hand last night. It's upstairs. This was a signal to Myra, a quick introduction to the story that he wanted her to stay with when they were inevitably separated and questioned. He wanted to make sure she knew what the story was. A fight got out of hand last night. The police finally got into the bedroom. They discovered a bunch of guns and Edward Evans' body. Ian was placed under arrest. Myra and her grandmother went to a neighbor's house to wait it out because the police obviously had to now occupy the home because it was a crime scene. The pathologist who looked at Edward Evans' body found that he had been hit 14 times with an ax and then strangled with some sort of cord. Ian Brady tried to spin a narrative to the cops that he and Edward had met, they were having a drink, a fight got out of control, David Smith was there, David Smith was his ally in this, he helped him take Eddie out, and eventually Ian had just ended up killing Eddie because Eddie was attacking him. So he basically put David Smith into the equation, completely removed Myra Hindley. When Myra was questioned, she only said that she didn't do it and Ian didn't do it. I am saying nothing. Whatever Ian has done, I have done. The house was searched, the garden and yard dug up. The police removed many items from the house and Myra's car. The letter Ian had been writing, which was to his boss, explaining why he wouldn't be at work that day, a notebook containing Ian's drawings, four sheets of paper and Myra's wallet written in Ian's handwriting, giving instructions of how to dispose of Edward's body, and a tartan-covered photo album. As Superintendent Talbot looked through these things, he noticed something. Amongst the doodles in Ian's notebook, the name John Kilbride was written. This started the domino effect of putting everything together, of connecting the murder of Edward Evans to the other missing children in the area that had disappeared within the past couple of years. Ian Brady was charged with the murder of Edward Evans and he had only one request, that the Sloans, his adoptive family back in Scotland, were not brought into this at all. He didn't want them notified. Myra was not charged or arrested at that time and she spent the next four days destroying any evidence she could get her hands on. They had a storage locker where Brady kept a lot of things, 
So she basically burned everything that she could find in there. Brady is quoted as saying, she destroyed the master list, addresses, photographs, and negatives. Thank God the police didn't discover those. According to Ian, amongst those things that Myra burned were documents and papers and an indication as to where Keith Bennett might be buried because Keith Bennett's body still to this day has never been found. His family still doesn't have their little boy back. Myra was unable to destroy one thing though that was very important and it was a luggage ticket for the storage area at the Manchester railway station. Ian had brought and left there two suitcases that were closely guarded and were more important to him than anything he had in their house or in the storage area. Myra was unable to get this though because the prayer book was her prayer book from when she was a child and that book was in the home that she shared with her grandmother which was now occupied by the police who were searching for evidence. David Smith had claimed that Ian told him he'd killed before and that some of those bodies were buried on the moors and once they saw John Kilbride's name written in Ian's diary or notebook, they thought there could be a connection here. So Joe Mounsey was contacted. Mounsey immediately wanted to talk to David and he also wanted to look over all the things that had been collected from the home and from Myra's car and of special interest to him was that tartan covered photo album. The Moors took up an area of 400 square miles and the only way to find out if the theory that Ian was connected to John Kilbride was to just get out there and dig. This search began on October 10th, a Sunday. David and Maureen were brought along to see if they were able to pinpoint the areas that they had been with Ian and Myra. They used the photographs in the photo album as starting points. Neither Maureen or David were able to distinguish one area of the Moor from another, so they went in blind essentially, but Mounsey was fueled with his need to find John Kilbride and he spent hours out there desperately comparing photographs to spots on the moors using yellow paint to signify possible areas that could be searched. They searched by pushing sticks into the ground and then smelling the end of the sticks for the scent of decomposition. They had been able to narrow some areas down by finally matching them to locations in the pictures but when they searched these areas they found nothing. On Monday October 11th Myra was arrested as an accessory to the murder of Edward Evans. She said she wasn't going to say a word until she'd been given access to a lawyer, specifically the same lawyer that Ian Brady used. Both Myra and Ian were placed in a Risley Remand Center. They were brought there in separate vehicles and they were kept separated while they were there, but Ian was able to get a letter to Myra. In the letter, he told her he was most likely going to get life in prison for the murder and it wasn't something he could handle. He needed her to be brave, like Emmy Goering, the self-proclaimed First Lady of the Third Reich. When her husband, Herman, was sentenced to hanging, he took a cyanide pill. Ian told Myra that she was strong enough to start a new life without him and he closed the letter with, I love you, in German. Before their first court appearance, Myra asked for permission to see Ian, and that was granted. During this conversation, Ian asked her if she was able to recover the luggage ticket from the prayer book, and she told him she wasn't able to. The heads of the police departments in Cheshire, Lancaster, and Manchester counties had gotten together and compared their missing persons cases to find out if there was any connections to Ian and Myra. They narrowed these cases down to eight. In those eight were the files of John Kilbride, Keith Bennett, Pauline Reed, and Leslie Ann Downey. When Myra's neighbor, Elsie Masterson, who was Patty's mother, received a letter from Myra asking her to look after Poppet, Myra and Ian's dog, Elsie thought she should contact the police. And it wasn't because of the letter, it was mainly because her daughter Patty had been spending a lot of time with Ian and Myra, and she had been along with them for trips to the moors. So Elsie thought that maybe Patty could help them out on the moors, just like they had been trying to have David and Maureen help them pinpoint areas they had been brought. Maybe Patty could do the same. On Friday, October 15th, Patty went with some officers to the moors and pointed out a rocky area. This spot was Holland Brown Knoll, which was only a few kilometers away from Westerson Head. On the Edward Evans disposal plan paper, one of the codes was WH, so the detectives speculated that these letters could stand for Westerson Head. Patty told them that on their trips to the moors, she would often sit with Myra in the car while Ian prowled the moors with a spade in his hand. But that this was the exact same spot they had been on Christmas morning, the last trip she took with them to the moors. This was the spot they'd been the same day that Leslie Ann Downey went missing. They planned to search the area thoroughly the next day. While all this was happening, David Smith was again questioned thoroughly, and he was kind of like, I've already told you everything I know, so he's going through all the stories again, but then a detail popped up that he hadn't mentioned before, that Ian kind of had an obsession or a thing for railway stations. The powers that be at the police station at this time, the upper levels in the police station, they were kind of sick of this investigation dragging on. As far as they were concerned, there had been one murder, 
Edward Evans, and they had Ian Brady and Myra Hindley in custody. So what was there to look into anymore? They were spending all this manpower, time, and money searching these moors, which was a needle in the haystack kind of search, for what? You didn't know if these kids were actually even connected to Myra and Ian. You didn't know if these kids were even dead. And you definitely didn't know if they were buried on the moor. So the people on the police force who kind of had the decisions of when investigation started and when they ended were reaching their breaking point and saying this needs to be wrapped up. But there was a few officers who were hell-bent on seeing it through, that they felt that they had an instinct, that there was a connection here, there was something there, and they couldn't stop until they found it. One of these men was Joe Mounty, and the other was Alec Carr, who had been there the day that Ian had been arrested. Carr began calling local railway stations and asking them to check their unclaimed baggage. This was happening at exactly the same time that Arthur Benfield, the lead detective on the case at that time, I guess, was telling Mouncey that they had one more day to search the moors, and then they needed to move on. But within an hour, the case broke. The suitcases had been found. An officer from the British Transport Police found them after getting the call from Carr. The suitcases had been checked in by Brady, and each time he had visited them and placed more items in, he carefully placed his own hair over the locks so he would know if they had been tampered with. Inside the suitcases were books, photographs, a gun, two knives, a communion belt, a library ticket that belonged to David Smith's father, a black wig, diaries of Ian's from 1965 and 1962, Myra's diary from 1964, Ian's birth certificate, one of Ian's notebooks, a key tied to a shoelace, and another key wrapped up in a piece of cloth, a study on Jack the Ripper, 54 photo negatives, 55 prints, and two reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Carr took the two suitcases back to the police station, and inside there were pictures of Leslie Ann Downey, but he didn't know who she was just from seeing them. The child in the pictures was blindfolded and gagged, and it was hard to make out her features. Carr and another detective he was working with, Farley, who was also at the house when Ian had been arrested, they decided that their first order of business the next day was to identify the girl and find out who she was. They both went back to Carr's house for dinner that night, and afterwards they were watching TV, and a picture of Leslie flashed on the TV, an update on her case. They both looked at each other and said, that's the same girl in the pictures. They knew they had just figured out who the little girl was in Ian Brady's secret photographs. They listened to the reel-to-reel -reel tapes at the station the next day, and when they heard the tape of Leslie on it, everybody was shocked and horrified and disgusted. John Stalker, an investigator on the case, said when the tape was played at the police station before the trial, he saw senior detectives and legendary crime reporters, hard men who had been through the war and seen terrible things, dissolve into tears. What did come from the tape was a pretty clear consensus. Ian Brady was a psychopath and a vicious murderer, but Myra Hindley was a willing accomplice. On the last day that they were allowed to search the moors before the search was called off, Leslie Ann Downey's body was discovered. Her clothes were piled on top of her face. A blue coat, pink cardigan, and a tartan skirt. With her clothes, they found a string of white plastic beads, this special Christmas gift from her brother, Denny. Okay guys, I am going to end part two here. There's only gonna be one more part. We're not putting this into a six-parter. My throat really, really hurts, so it's kind of been painful to be talking for this long, but I will record part two within the next couple of days, have that up by middle of the week, end of the week for you guys, and then we will start on our next case. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much for always coming back and watching. I appreciate you beyond words. I love you guys so much. If you want to email me any case recommendations, my email is stephanieharlow at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram. It's also Stephanie Harlow and on Twitter I'm Steph underscore Harlow. Thank you guys so much. Stay kind and stay beautiful and I will see you soon. Bye. Curl your arms around a whisper as she